So can, what is enlightenment and can I achieve it? When I first started speaking, um, there's this uh, guy that I've posted his music a few times called Nick Willoughby, and he's a friend of mine. And I was buying a car off him and my dad came to help me pick it up. So my dad drove me there so I could pick up the car. And we went into the pub for a drink with um, Nick and his brother. <laughs> and my dad was sitting there and they said to him, I can't remember if it was Nick or his brother, said, what's it like having an enlightened daughter? And I knew my dad didn't know what that meant. Like enlightened, I think there's the enlightenment of Christianity or something, but enlightened, I don't think it meant anything to him. It was like enlightened, enlightened about what? Enlightened about politics or enlightened about her mission in life. And he just sat there and because he didn't know what to do, he went, it's very good. <laughs> it's just this awkward moment. It was so funny. <laughs> Inside I was laughing, but externally I was just like. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So when I first heard about like, enlightenment, it was through Buddhism. And the enlightenment that was sold to me was so spectacular. You know, it was really about becoming a superhero. Being a bit of a sci-fi fan, it was um, quite enticing to me. Like I, I remember particularly, I've spoken about this before, like walking through walls, the, um, the teleporting back in time. Well, not teleporting, but like going inside your mind and going back in time and listening to a book. But a sermon, living in a cave for months on end without having to eat, lucid dreaming, reading people's minds. Yeah, and of course, being free of suffering and expanding to higher realms of consciousness. Yeah. And I, I think the first book I read was... Um, by by this lady who um, who lived in a cave in the Himalayas, a Western lady. I think she was Italian. Um, she lived in a um, cave for seven years by herself in the Him Himalayan mountains, um, and sometimes she would be snowed into her tiny cave for months on end. So she wouldn't really be able to go out. And one time, I think she nearly died and she had to like pickaxe through it to get air in. Like it was so thick, the snow. I think maybe in the summertime, she'd walk down to the monastery to get more like grains of rice and chickpea and lentils. Yeah, like dried food. And I just think, I remember thinking like, wow. When I first went to university and left home, like I remember getting to university and um, I kind of got into Buddhism around the same time. And like the first weekend, you know, after all classes had finished, I just sat there and I was like, what should I do? And just remember having this like expanse of time. You know, when I was um, back at my parents' house, there was always like kind of something you had to do, whether it be walking with dogs or bathing the dogs or um, cleaning the house or not that I'm sure I didn't do it that regularly um, or some sort of family party or there'd be people coming and going you'd have your kind of routine I remember getting to university and just being so lost in my time off especially if like all the people in my dormitory had left just that and um and so when I heard this about a lady being by herself for like seven years, I did begin to learn how to live by myself. But listening to that, I just was amazed. Like you have to be so free in order to do that. Most people crave so much physical intimacy and they're so terrified of loneliness. Yeah, I really respected that. And... Um, this is like going down story lane. And then like a few years later, I remember I tried an attempt at a solo retreat. But I'd done many retreats, like meditation retreats. And I tried a solo retreat. Um, 
and I think I lasted five days. I was meant to last seven. I'm not sure. I might have said I lasted another amount of days in another video because I can't remember how long it was, so I'm kind of guessing. Um, I didn't complete it. Uh, the place that I went to was a retreat centre and I didn't realise that retreat centre would be empty with no one there and um, and then there was like no one around me for miles and miles so at night I had immense fear coming up about I presume men but also maybe yeah most probably men I don't think it was monsters like just a man breaking in or something or someone breaking in yeah and then I think on like the fifth night I just couldn't take it anymore and in England sometimes the nights start at 3 30 in the afternoon and don't finish until like seven or eight in the morning so I was kind of like I think I got to I just couldn't take it another night being paranoid during the day it was perfect I could do it I'd got to the stage where without TV, without phone, without internet, without books. I think I had spiritual books that I could um, organize my time and meditate and sit through the discomfort of boredom or loneliness. But in the evening, that paranoia and that fear was too strong, eventually. Hmm. Yeah. So we all come into this subject with ideas of enlightenment. I, I highly doubt that anyone gets into non-duality first and then hears there is no enlightenment. I suspect that most people come in to non-duality already having had spiritual teachings and having some idea of enlightenment. And even in non-duality, people have an idea of enlightenment. So enlightenment to the Buddha was um, waking up to your true nature and going past, I think, all habit and karma, like all your karma. But maybe that's different in different Buddhism, like there's so many different groups, there's so many different teachings. Um, in non-duality, it can be like waking up to the recognition of consciousness, it can be an energetic expansion. Some people in non-duality would say like going to higher levels of consciousness. Some people might say going past habits, conditions, some people say dropping of self and assumedly, presumably, that is what people call enlightenment in non-duality. Yeah. No, oh, interesting. And it sounds very enticing, this idea especially if you've been suffering a lot in your life and you come across this idea of the end of suffering. I think a lot of people, most people, suffer in this life. The Buddha said the first noble truth is to realize that life is suffering. And I think that's true. I really think that it's inevitable if you don't explore this subject. There might be the occasional few that never develop a separate self. But I think most people do and some people have stronger strong, stronger senses of self earlier in age but inevitably through life if you've got like less of a stronger sense of self it will get stronger so the time you're in your 40s and 50s it will be stronger and um, what I mean by stronger is like more identification to it sometimes when people have had a lot of suffering in childhood then then by the time they're 20 they're more identified with it and suffer a lot more in some ways that can be a good thing because it makes them ask questions whereas if you go on to your 40s and 50s and that's 40s of 50 years of believing in the separate self um, which is okay as well it means that you most probably didn't have so much suffering when you're younger to ask the questions some people do but they just didn't come across this subject um, yeah Uh, and so that's really enticing, the idea of the end of suffering or, or the idea of anything that I've spoken about. Like the mind likes that. The mind likes to have things which it can achieve. I, I can become enlightened. And nowadays, because everyone's speaking about it, it's like 
yeah, this is really a possibility. I can become enlightened. And the mind likes it because it likes imagining itself as something. Because if you don't imagine yourself as something, who are you? So it, like, the mind likes to imagine itself as something and then putting effort into becoming that. And enlightenment surely sounds like a superior idea. The mind also really likes superiority because then it has a comparison to somebody down there and it up there and that gives you a pleasurable feeling. But it also gives you a sense of who you are because you're comparing yourself against other people. There are other people that are inferior to me and now I know who I am. I am superior to these people. A lot of the time the separate self or the personal identification is looking to be something not because it's bad just because if it's not something then it doesn't exist and then if it's going to choose what it's going to be most of the time it's going to pick pleasure sometimes it picks pain but that's just because of weird conditioning so you can identify with pain because that's maybe brought you pleasure when you were younger but even though in the moment it brings you pain to identify with pleasure there has been some learning like yeah if i suffer the most if i'm in agony if i'm bleeding if i'm dying then i get attention and love but all of it is about you, 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 you being something. Because who are you, what are you, if you're not anything? So now, if I take away the idea of enlightenment, maybe you're okay with that, but you're like, okay, there's going to be no self. Or there's going to be an energetic expansion. And these are all things that the you holds on to and moves towards in time but i will give you a little hint if they do not exist now it's not your true nature and it's really not so relevant it's only relevant when you're in activity of things so this idea of you becoming enlightened doesn't exist now so that's not your true nature that's not about freedom that's about you becoming something solidified and something in time. So freedom isn't a thing in time, it's not a thought. Mm, yummy, yummy, yummy. So freedom isn't a thought. Freedom isn't an idea. Freedom is freedom. And it's your essence. It's what's right here now. It's what's screaming in everything. Some people would call it consciousness, but it's even more refined than that because consciousness is still a position. It's actually everything, which is no thing. You could say, if you really wanted to use the word consciousness, it's like the freedom is in the perception of everything, which is everything. Like everything is perceiving. Everything is perceiving. There's not something perceiving it. It's like everything is perceiving now. Everything is conscious now. And that's the experience. It's not, it's not the experience that there's somebody inside that body being conscious of things. The experience is there is everything. And there's perception happening in those things. Consciousness is the things you experience. Because where does your consciousness start and stop? The mind likes the idea that I'm conscious and I'm looking at something. But how can I be outside of your consciousness? How would you know that I exist if I'm outside your consciousness? How would you know where I am or well, that I am? If you're not conscious of it, then it doesn't exist to you. So therefore, I am inside your consciousness. Everything you're experiencing now is inside your consciousness. But you've got to take out the words of inside and yours because there's not really an inside because there's not an outside. And there's not a yours because there's not a theirs. 
there's not a you and me, but it's just language and it's easier to speak in that way. So your freedom isn't in this idea of you becoming enlightened. Your freedom is in what you are now, is what's already here. So enlightenment is a daydream for you to get to. It's okay to have these words to speak about something, but it's not actually what you're really looking for. You're not looking to become something. This is the minus program. It's as you stop identifying with all those things that you believe yourself to be, that something else is revealed that's magical and mysterious and infinite, that's never born or dies, that doesn't suffer or not suffer, that doesn't do or not do, that doesn't love or hate. It just is. And to me, I would call that love, like it's inseparable from love. It's like total contentment with what it is beyond any judgment. Hmm.
So what you crave, this idea of you becoming enlightened, is a pleasure. That's not freedom. That is a pleasure. It's pleasurable to imagine yourself as enlightened. It's pleasurable to imagine not suffering. It's pleasurable to imagine yourself better than other people. I know that sounds mean, but it is pleasurable for a lot of people when they believe in that idea of being superior. Um, It's pleasurable to imagine yourself as unhurtable, untouchable, beyond enlightened, like Jesus or the Buddha or Muhammad or um, God. That is pleasurable. That is not freedom. That's the same as imagining having a big house or um, a quiet space or really successful or lots of money. It's another trap. It doesn't mean don't go for those things. The body is set up towards to move towards pleasure. I'm not saying like the big house is wrong or anything. I'm not having judgment saying one or the other. My personal preference is simplicity. Like the more work, the less fun, but that's my preference. But what I am saying is in no way is that your freedom. When you believe that to be your freedom, you will suffer because there will be this identification in the person and then this like cycling like on a bicycle really fast to try to catch up with it and try to get to this place in time, and more than likely you will never get to that place in time. Even if you get super rich, my experience is that the people still don't feel like they've got enough, so they still are like hoarding all the um, nuts like a squirrel sitting on it. I need more, that's why we have billionaires. Like why does somebody need to be a billionaire? What could they possibly do with that? Like, have 200 children that can inherit it? You can't take it to your grave. Where are you going with that, dude? Or dudess? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I forgot what flow I was on there. Yeah, so this idea that you are going to get enlightened is simply another idea that's seeking. And the wisdom is, is what is free right now? This is your birthright and this is the freedom in every instant. Whether you're rich or poor, good or bad, in jail or free, having 10 kids or none. Ask the be so this is freedom beyond what's happening in flow so what else is happening There is something here that's always been here that is screaming at you like, yeah, yeah, here I am, here I am. It's right here. That's in all things. It's absolutely free. And it doesn't belong to you. It is you. The you comes and goes in it. The ideas come and go in it. The idea of enlightenment comes and goes in it. Your behaviours, your habits, conditions come and go in it. So what else is free? This is it, baby. This is it. 
and it's so miraculous and beautiful. It's what always is. And you are not doing it. You are being done by it. You are being created by who you are. So the you, the illusory you, always thinks it's driving the dream bus. Like, yeah, I'm on my way to Queensland. Boopy doopy doop. But it's uh, not driving. It's being driven. It's like one of those kids, you know, with the toy wheels. It's like, <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? You're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. It's still not turning. There's something wrong with the truck. And that's what most people suffer about. You know, a lot of suffering is around the idea of you having done it wrong. That you've done life wrong. You could always pick up on things that you've done wrong. You know, Jesus' famous saying is, God, I've got to remember it now. Um, his favorite, one of the most beautiful sayings is, you know, when they found out that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, he said, Thou who has not sinned, throw the first rock. That is so true. All of us have messed up, including myself. I have done some big boo-boos in my life. I was just thinking of a funny boo-boo that I could say, but... The one that comes to mind is so inappropriate, it just popped into my mind, you know, like a frog jumping out of the reeds, like, <laughs> it's so random. I remember when I was um, a teenager and I went to the doctors about having piles and, um, and I really fancied the doctor, they were really good looking and it was like really awkward going about piles and got tested and, I mean, like, I didn't know how piles, so they tested me and they realised I had piles. And then I was, I was leaving and saying thank you and goodbye. I let out the biggest, most humongous fart in the universe. It was so embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the only mistake, but that was just what jumped into mind. I was, you know, like trying to find something that would be quite embarrassing of mistakes I've made, but that is just like so nobody doing it. It's like life conspired there, it conspired to make me have sexual attraction, and then it conspired to push air into my anus. Well, actually, yeah, we don't need to go into detail there. Hmm. You know. Yeah, professionals, lawyers, doctors, they're all sitting there like, oh. There was me thinking I was getting into the refined subject of Indian philosophy. Learning from an English woman, and she's talking about anal farts. Off! All the people that are Rupert P Spira followers are off now. They're gone. She's gone too low. No. It reminds me, um, there was actually a comment on my channel last week, which I wanted to comment on. Um, I don't often look at the comments, just because I just don't think you should if you put yourself on YouTube. These circums. But sometimes they get seen. And there was one that I saw last week, which I thought I would comment on. Okay, so the bunion is off. I thought it was quite funny. Well, no, not funny, just funny, but I also thought it was quite funny. So, this is from David Pinto, and he says, Your cuss words and your strong emotions condemning our false projections evokes in me judgments in my attitude towards Maya. I don't think it's constructive. I'm disappointed in you. Firstly, um, I really hear what you're saying, David, and there was no intention to shame you in any way for your feelings. And I'm so sorry that that was evoked when I was mocking. I don't know what I was mocking, but I'm sure I was mocking something. But it's really not my intention. My intention is to help you grow, grow and flourish and to um, see beyond your illusions. Um, but yeah. 
And the reason that it happens most of the time is because my predisposition is to normally try to find the humour in things. And so it's easy for me to make faces and sort of um, make the ego out to be a bad person because then it gives me some repertoire to make humour. You know, if both, both of the characters I'm doing are kind of being nice, then normally <laughs> it's harder to make humour. But if I make a grotesque or a big character, then it makes more humour. I don't really think about it, it just comes out automatically. Yeah. So I really understand that and I really feel like, yeah, you need to be more loving towards your false projections about yourself. Like a lot of people go around in so much shame and negativity. So that, but the next thing which is funny is your cuss words. Can I just say, any time, like we don't call it cuss words, more than likely because we're the English people, you know, with the pronunciation that would easily become cuss, you know, it would, with a T on the end, but I won't say it. Um, so we don't call it cuss words in English because of our pronunciation, we call it swear words. So every time I swear on YouTube, <laughs> I really get a kicking. <laughs> this went on this talk about me um, swearing. There's more. I won't read the, the next parts. But I'll tell you, I really do. I've like I've I've had people write to me. I might have said one f word, and I've had people write to me and tell me um, let's repress sexuality. You know, I really get it if I swear on YouTube. And I just want to be frank with you all. I swear a lot in daily life because I think it is hilarious that we, well, not a lot in daily life, but I do swear because I think it's hilarious that we as humans make up these things called swear words or bad words based on sexual acts or sexual parts of our bodies. It's so stupid. It's so simple-minded. And so I do it because it's kind of ironic to swear I think like it's it's like having a laugh at how silly we are as humans and how repressed we are about our bodies. So I don't have an issue with swearing. I tend not to swear on YouTube because it offends so many people and also because more importantly my videos get suppressed if I swear. If you don't believe me go back and look at my numbers like how much I got for my last video and then the next video is, I know that you don't believe an algorithm goes through the video, but it does, it goes through the video and it picks up what you're saying. Like if I say the C word about the P, the thing that's happened in the society and we had to have the I word, if I say any of that, it gets suppressed. And because I swore last week, I got suppressed. <laughs> and I just think that's so funny. I just think it's so crazy. Like, the fact that we have swear words on sexual organs is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. We are ridiculous sometimes as a species. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of like swearing for that. Like, um, and then it's also a conditioning as well. I was brought up with swearing. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I just wanted to comment on that because firstly, I just wanted you all to see the humour in the fact that I swore. And then secondly, just to say, like, I really don't mean to shame anybody that listens. Like, um, I get what you mean about someone making a lot of fun about something. It's like, oh, especially if you see that dynamic in yourself. We've got to love these juicy bits about ourselves. You get to live them. And that is the way that they begin to, ah, not always, but settle. The more you reject, the more they persist. 